All right, good evening, everybody. Oh, we got to do better. Come on, we do this every day. There we go. Say, okay, students, you can't get shown up by the adult side. Come on. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Ben Dworkin. I am the founding director of the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship, now in its fifth year here at Rowan University. Thank you. <laughs> on, be on behalf of the university and uh, the institute, I want to welcome all of you to our evening with the New Jersey Senate Republican leader, the Honorable Steve Orho. <laughs> it's, it's actually great that all, of, I really appreciate that all of you were able to join us uh, tonight, uh, including several dignitaries. Let me just uh, recognize with us uh, this evening, we have Senator Edward Durr. Thank you, sir, for coming. And Assemblywoman Beth Sawyer, thank you. <laughs> I do also want to just begin by thanking all of our co-sponsors uh, for this evening. Uh, we had several partners on campus who helped promote this event, including the Bontavoglio Honors Concentration, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies, the Department of History, the Department of Political Science and Economics, the Department of Law and Justice, and the Program in American Studies. And I do want to also recognize the strong annual financial support of New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance, NJM, who have helped underwrite all of our programming for the year. So at this point, I just want, uh, and some of you will get used to this, ask everyone to please take out their cell phone. And as is our RIPAC tradition, let me get this set up. It's time to take a selfie. So everybody smile here, OK? Oh, wrong one, hold on. Right. All right, everybody smile, say right back. Hey, right back. Okay. Take one of yourselves and then turn your phone off so it doesn't ring in the middle of the thing, okay? Now that you're holding it. Um, the vision of the Rowan Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship, known as RIPAC, is to inform, engage, and train Rowan students, Rowan faculty staff and our fellow citizens in all aspects of politics and policy and being an active citizen. Now we are just one part of an even grander enterprise, the dynamic growth that is of Rowan University, now home to 23,000 students. And here to offer some welcoming remarks is one of the key people leading us into that future. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the Provost and Chief Academic Officer of Rowan University, Dr. Tony Lohman. All right, all right. So, I don't like my uh, prof's mask. Uh, so our students, you saw your announcement today, right? So hopefully this will be one of the last mat events that we're going to have one of these. Let's, let's hope. Let's hope that's it. You know, for, for, for our audience today, we, we, we announced, based on uh, all the wonderful guidance from, from the CDC as well as from state, and really some outstanding public health experts that will move to mask optional campus starting Monday. So to our students, we're going to be very glad to finally get you back into that face-to-face -face learning where we can see each other and interact in a way that we really need to do. I know, I know you've lost a lot the last couple of years, and I really appreciate your patience and, and willingness to adapt with the rest of us. Um, but it's great to be here for another wonderful RIPAC event. Um, I understand we had Senator Durr last night here, so thank you for coming and speaking with our students as well. Uh, but tonight we're, we're treated um, to another visitor. And actually, we we're having a conversation, really brief conversation, about North Jersey, South Jersey, or even if there is a Central Jersey. Um, down here in, in South Jersey, we kind of feel like we're ourselves. How many, how many of our students, or how many of our people are, are South Jersey people here? <laughs> no. yeah, I, I know you're not, because it's in my remarks you're not. <laughs> how about North Jersey? Where have we got our North? There we go. All right, we got two. All right. All right, will anyone here admit they're from Central Jersey or even think you're from, really? Well, that, that really killed that theory that I had coming into the, to the, to the conversation. But it's good to know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out how we go. 
Um, but one of the things we've done, as, 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 as you know, we've had tremendous growth down here at, in, in South Jersey here at Rowan University in, in less than 10 years. We've doubled uh, our, our student count from a little over 10,000, almost 23,000. We've built new buildings. We have now have two medical schools. We'll be launching the vet school, the first veterinary medicine school in the state of New Jersey. Uh, and, and it's all been done, really, by a lot of support from, from South Jersey. But what we've really had to do is, is try to find champions in, in North Jersey that would, would reach across the aisle and work with us and help push Rowan. And understand that a strong Rowan University down here with outstanding students, which we have, outstanding faculty, outstanding research, helps drive the economy of the state of New Jersey. And that's, that's really what we've been doing over the last couple of years. And, and certainly having a friend in North Jersey, uh, having a friend who will drive two hours on a, on a Wednesday night down to see us, is, is, it truly means a lot to us. So we want to thank Senator Rowe for all the support over the last couple of years and, and helping us become what we have today. And you know, over the next three to five years, you're gonna see things down here that we've never seen down South Jersey. We, we will have a research one university down here in South Jersey as good as any research university in the country. So, so thank you for your support and we're very lucky to have you tonight. So, and, and to our students and guests who are here tonight, thanks for coming out. And uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Ben Dworkin to get this program started. Thank you, Dr. Lohman. Uh, and just for what it's worth, if you lived in a place where you got both Philadelphia TV and New York TV, that's Central Jersey, okay? That's, that's just my academic defense. Anyway, listen, here's how the program is gonna work tonight. I'm about to invite up a Rowan student who will uh, in turn introduce the Republican leader. When Senator Oroho is done with his remarks, I'm gonna to return to the stage with some of the questions that many of you submitted when you registered uh, for the event, and a few of you handed in some questions when you came in this evening. And I'll ask them and he'll respond in front of everybody. So please join me in welcoming to the stage from the Rowan University class of 2022, Greg Aquilino. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dorkin. Yes, as you now know, I am Gregory Aquilino. I am a senior triple major from Mountie from New Jersey, and it is an honor to be a part of RIPAC and be here with you tonight. New Jersey Senate Republican leader Steve Oroho graduated with a degree in accounting from St. Francis University in Pennsylvania. Before entering politics, Senator Oroho had a considerable career in New York City, where among other positions, he served as senior vice president of finance in Young and Rubicam. He is also a certified public accountant and financial planner. For as long as I've been alive, Senator Oroho has been committed to political life. In 2020, or 2001, he won a seat on the Franklin Borough Council. His success did not stop there. He moved on to the Sussex County Freeholder Board in 2005, then continued to the State Senate winning election in 2007. In 2021, his peers elected him the Republican leader of the Senate. And on a more personal note, Senator Orho has been a coach for the Pope John 23rd High School in Sparta, New Jersey, which is pretty much the opposite end of the world from here. <laughs> As someone who was a three sport varsity athlete in high school, I know how important coaches are during those years. Through wins or losses, coaches bring out the best in their team. I will carry the lessons that my coaches taught me for the rest of my life. Senator Oroho has had a similar experience on his students and indeed on countless New Jerseyans who look to him for leadership. His continuing dedication to his team, his community, and to New Jersey demonstrates that he lives a life of public service every day. As I prepare to enter the working world following graduation, I hope to live that same kind of life. Fellow students, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome New Jersey Senate Republican leader, 
the Honorable Steve Orho. That's a tough act to follow. I'll tell you what, Greg, thank you so much for the, uh, for the introduction. And doctor, thank you very much. Um, no, it's, it's, it's really interesting. You talk about coaching. And um, I never thought I'd do this, ever. And I, I'm, I'm here with a room of a lot of political, three majors, but uh, political science majors and whatnot. And I studied accounting. So if people say, like, how do you ever get involved into elected office? Well, first of all, you can tell, as Dr. Dworkin would tell, <laughs> my picture, right? <laughs> This is what elected officers will do to you, all right? The only thing I can wear now in this picture is the tie, all right? The suit is somewhere in, you know, you, you keep your suits, right? And they're all like, like according to size. I, I think this might, well, maybe I'm saving it for like my burial suit or something, I don't know. But anyway, so the tie I still have the shirt, long gone. The hair color, long gone, all right? Um, but anyway, the, it, it's interesting how you get into, into elected office. I never thought I would, I would be in elected office. Certainly never thought I'd be in, 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 in the Senate, and therefore never thought I'd be the Senate Republican leader. And I thank Senator Durr for voting for me. Um, but um, so I just want to give you a little bit of, a little bit of background a little bit about what it is to be in the legislature um, and what some of the most important things it is that you know a legislator does that maybe people don't realize you know um, I grew up in a town called West Milford in northern New Jersey my wife Rita and I met in in uh, St. Francis University in Loretto as, as uh, Pennsylvania as, as Greg was saying uh, she studied um, medical technology she is actually born and raised in Salem County. Uh, she was born in Salem Hospital. And we got married at St. Mary's in Salem. I actually worked in Salem for a, a couple of years. I was at uh, anchor hocking as a skid loader and a, a, what called a sweeper there. I made some pretty good money to go back to school there. Um, and then I also worked at a gas station, I guess on Route 40 in, in, Wood, in, in Woodstown. Um, but then we started, um, we got married in 1980, and I started with a company called Price Waterhouse. Now it's PwC, Price Waterhouse Coopers. And people say, well, you know, how'd you pick accounting? Well, I was, I was good in math, so I thought I would pick accounting. Well, that got me through the first day, because then <laughs> after it was all said and done. But one of the, one of the, one of the principles I have, have faith because some things just happened for a reason. So I did well in accounting. I actually uh, I graduated uh, you know, high in the class. My first elected office was college president, not of the student body, not the whole college, but the student <laughs> body. I didn't even know I won. I didn't even know I ran. <laughs> a good friend of my, uh, my wife, Rita, when we were juniors, uh, Linda had said uh, to Rita, says, I want to be in the uh, vice president, but I need somebody to run for president. So you think I can put Steve's name down for write-in? And I'm like, and so she said, yeah, yeah, you can put his name down. So I go to check now that I, you know, I go to the mailbox, the box, I see this banner above the mailboxes, vote write in Steve Oroho for class president. So I said, I'm not gonna win this. So I, so I t and Rita told me by that time what had been happening. So I get a phone call, not on a cell phone, right? <laughs> the phone rings in the hall, because we had one phone, right? And uh, congratulations. I said, for what? He says, well, you won. You're now the class president. You know? That was my first elected office. I also I ran for um, senior class president, and, I, and I, did, I did win. But I thought that was it for elected office. I didn't think I'd ever do it again. So I had worked in New York City, Price Waterhouse, a company called, also a company called WR Grace, and a company called Young and Rubicam. And then Rita and I have five children. And at the time, I was traveling all around the world. 
and had said, listen, if I could take 10 years and mill my life, because my father had passed away when he was 53, and I was, uh, how was when I was, I was 23 when he passed away. We already had our first child, Rita Mary. And I said, if I could take 10 years in the middle of my life, and thank God I had done well enough, that I always know I'd have to go back into corporate America. And lucky enough, I started as, I'm a CPA, and I also started, I also have my certified financial planners. So I started a small business, and I did things I never thought I'd ever do before. I, I volunteered, I coached high school football, I coached uh, high school baseball, I did you know little league as well. And then one, one day, uh, somebody said, we, I grew up, um, we're now living in Franklin Borough, small school, small town. And um, th somebody said, would, would you uh, consider being on the Economic Development Council? So I said, I said, sure, I will. And then, so I got a little bit involved in that way. And then the mayor of the town decided to resign and move. So all of a sudden, the Republican committee said, Steve, would you consider being mayor for the town? I'm like, they want me to be mayor, you know? <laughs> so I was like, sure. So the way it works is they have to put up three candidates. And thank God I didn't get it, because I would have had no idea what I was doing, right? But because they picked somebody on the council, and they moved, them to, uh, moved Ed Allen to mayor, they said, there's now a vacancy. Would you consider being on the, the council? And they put up three names, and I was one of them. And I did get that, because uh, the council appointed me. And I've always, and I was to, uh, 2001, and I've always been on the finance committees uh, for wherever, whether it be the council, or the freeholder board, or now in, in the Senate. Um, and I, I said, holy mackerel, this is really interesting about you know, how much it affects people's lives and, and whatnot. So uh, I served on the Franklin, served on the Franklin Council, and then uh, they decided to uh, say, hey, Steve, would you consider running for county freeholder? And uh, so I did. And then in 2007, longtime Senator, Senator Bob Littell, who was a longtime, you know, Senator, they, uh, he was, um, he decided to retire and he said, you know, obviously 21 counties, I think uh, would have been, um, he said, listen, would you run for Senate? How, what do I know about being a Senator or anything? So um, when we, and, and doctor, you do a, a, a political campaign class about it? Well, I should have took that class. <laughs> right? Because what happened was the first poll, they didn't tell me this, February, um, now the primary's in June, February, um, Senator Littell decided he was going to retire, and the the gentleman I would be who's uh, going to be running against uh, Senator Littell lived in Morris County, so that would have been Sussex County would have been one of only two counties that didn't have their own sitting senator. So he said, Steve, you got to uh, run for you know if you run for Senate. First poll they did, they didn't tell me. I was down 44 points. Nobody knew who the hell Steve Orhoff was, right? But the, some of the best assets I had was they knew my wife, Rita, and they knew my five kids. And they said, guess what? He can't be that bad. <laughs> so, uh, but they didn't tell me that I was, I was actually, uh, until I was down 22 points, and the look on my face was, how the heck can I make up 22 points? He goes, you already did. <laughs> now we just have to make, so I, I won by like 400 votes and stuff. But the issue was we had to run a campaign that Sussex County um, needs its own senator. So we were absolutely representing that in a district, and we just had, so we'll talk about redistricting and reapportionment and stuff. But we had three counties, all Sussex, some in Hunterdon, and some in Morris. So you can only imagine with all the advertising going out about Sussex County needs its own senator. Do you think the people in Morris and Hunter were real happy? Not too happy, right? So what I had to do quickly is once I did get elected, I won by 400 votes, was obviously reach out to those towns and show them that, you know, I was going to represent, obviously represent everybody. Um, and fortunate enough, we, you know, the issue of establishing relationships 
was able, we were able to do that, all right? And when I got into office, uh, I was on the Senate Budget and Appropriations Committee. I got appointed there. And if you ever want to understand how government works, go on the budget committees. Go on the budget, go on the finance committee and look at how the cash flow works and stuff. And, and you'll see how government, uh, you know, functions and, and things that you can do to, you know, to change it. But you all hear about the laws and stuff to get done. One of the most important things, and I was so fortunate that um, the, my chief of staff, uh, he should have been the real senator. His name is Jeff Spatola. He studied political science. Uh, and communications, and he was uh, my right-hand guy. Still is. We had a great, great, great partnership. He had wor he had come uh, worked with um, uh, Senator Joe Carrillos, who had been the state uh, Republican chairman and also a senator, and he had also become the chief of staff for Senator Bob Littell. And thank God he stayed with me in the office. He's still with me uh, today and does does a fantastic job. Because you hear about all the laws that get done. You think of bills that get done, and you know, whether it be controversial bills or, or just, you know, that's what the articles get. Well, one of the most important things we do as legislators, I don't care, Republican, Democrat, whatever, constituent service work. It's the most important thing that, that there is. And I, a lot of times I get asked, see, what is, what is your, your biggest um, accomplishment you think in and and they think that you're going to talk about laws and so just I think about the one day when there was a house fire and the how the house had, had um, burned down and there's a thing called the council on affordable housing and municipalities were required to charge um, a fee for you know for, the, for that would go into the housing now, I'll just just call it a housing trust fund. Now this family, and because of the way the law, the, not the law, the, the regulations had worked, um, had to pay a fee to rebuild a house that had been destroyed by a fire. So Jeff Spatola called me and said, "Steve, he says we got to do something about this." So and I was pretty pretty new into the into the office, and I said, "So you know where we got?" So I said well, we talk with the Department of Community Affairs. And it was during the Corzine administration, so a person by the name of Joe Doria, who had been a senator, he was now the commissioner of the Department uh, of Community Affairs. And I'm a brand new senator. This gentleman had been, uh, you know, a, a major senator. I think he had been, uh, was he a, a speaker as well, and Senate president, right? And he, um, and then he became under the Corzine administration the commissioner for uh, community affairs. So I had called them and I said, listen, this is, here's the situation that happened. And the town was of the, of the opinion that there was nothing they could do. And it was, it was a pretty hefty fee. Because the definition of demolition didn't, or for the rebuilding, didn't include if a house had, or something had burned down. So I was talking to him and I said, Commissioner, I said, it just, just doesn't right. And it, um, I left him a message. And about, I think it was probably 10, 10.30 at night, you know, he, had, he had, uh, was able to uh, call back. And we were talking, and he said, you know, he said, he, said, he looked in, into it, and he goes, he says, you're right, we're going to have to, he goes, and he changed it. He actually changed it the next morning. So that family didn't have to pay that fee. The family was able to, to rebuild. Obviously, the family was devastated. So, you know, I've done a lot of bills and number of laws, but people say, Is that, now, that's a day I'll never forget. I never forget, and most of the time people think that you know it's all about the laws or everything, but it's not. It's really when that phone rings, whether it be and we work with all different you know legislative offices ac across the state, just like an accounting firm, just like a lawyer's firm, just like an engineering firm. When that phone rings or you get an email or you get a you know now we get text messages, we get everything, right? Um, you, you you try to help somehow, some way, you try to help. And if you think about the past two years, and I was talking a little bit about this today. The idea, like in our offices, we had thousands of unemployment where we had to try and help people. Now, a legislative office, you cannot, you don't make the decision that says, okay, this case is okay uh, and gets approved. No, it, ha it obviously goes through the Department of Labor. 
But so many times where people could not get through, um, they, they maybe answered the question, um, you know, uh, you know, incorrectly for their case. Uh, there is also quite a bit of you know uh, fraud that occurs in that. So obviously the department is very, you know, uh, careful about a number of those things. However, if people were in, in dire straits, what happened during the pandemic. Uh, so all legislators' office dealt with that, whether it be motor vehicle, it be Department of Labor, but that's the things that happen as, as, uh, as an elected official. Um, and then obviously we have the, you know, we have the you know, laws that get, you know, get introduced and, and whatnot. But people, you know, people ask me, says, well, you know, what do you think about running for office? And I gotta tell you, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough on your family, right? Um, my, Rita and I, we have five children, three boys, two girls. My oldest is 40, my youngest is 30. Um, they're, pretty, they're pretty competitive, but if you think about it, um, and somebody asked a question today, they said, do you think our democratic process makes, I said, well, uh, makes people go after each other and, I, um, and be derogatory to each other or uncivil towards each other? And I, I, said, I said, well, first of all, it's important about how you treat people, right? I'm a Christian. I like to. I believe in the golden rule, and uh, uh, you know, and I, I think it's, I think that's you know, crit, you know, critically um, uh, important. But the uh, when 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 you sit and and you go through and you know, um, actually, I, forgot, I lost my train of thought completely. But when you sit there and you, and you know, the civility and and stuff like that 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 you need to that you need to have. Um, and working across, whether it be on, on different you know type of issues and, and whatnot, but all of a sudden, me as as a, as as a father, running running is, is difficult. Now I'm in an I'm in a district that, quite frankly, if you win by sixty percent, that's you know considered to be you know pretty good. Um, but at the same time, that means forty percent of the people don't agree with you. Or they, they may be, you know, calling you different names. When I, and I tell my, my, my children, if you, when you're in elected office, you really have to have two things. Uh, you know, um, bad short-term memory, just forget things, right? Forget the, you know, the political type things, or if somebody says something about it, forget it. Um, and, and the other thing is thick skin. Because no matter what, you're always going to, if you're going to do something well, or you're going to do something that means something, a lot of people aren't going to, a lot of people aren't going to like you or something. But how you react to them, because as I said, when that phone rings, I don't care if it's somebody who had said something bad about you, so just, when they need to, you know, when they need your help, believe me, they're real nice to you then, you know? But that's what it is. That's you know. So that's that's the most important thing, you know, that we do. And I will say, as as political uh, science majors and and, and whatnot, um, Jeff is is a, a huge partner for me. And I could think of how he has helped so many different people. Uh, how he's helped me. So when you're out there and say you go into whether you go into some you know, uh, legislative office, congressional office, local town, or something like this, you as, as a lot of, how many are political science majors here? Quite a, quite a few, right? You're gonna have an opportunity, believe it or not, to help a lot of people, including somebody like, like me. I was, I was uh, how old was I? I was like 40 years old before I even ran for, for office, all right? So, I just want to give you a little bit of you know feeling. Obviously, running for office is is, is difficult. Um, I didn't lose 55 pounds like Ed Durr, you know, lost 50 55 pounds. I mean, when you go door to door and to, people really they want to know you. And I, I, I two other things I, I'll, I'll say. I have never had anybody run for office that once they get in office say, you know what, it's not as much work as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> ever, ever. I always hear all the time, goes, God, I didn't think the reading, to do the job right, the reading is, is, is a lot. The other thing I tell people is this. When you go to the food store, especially in local elected politics, when you go to the food store, 
don't buy your ice cream first. Because everybody has a question for you, right? Now, when we were wearing these masks, a few things about the mask. What am I supposed to think when somebody tells me that you look better with it on? <laughs> what am I supposed to think about that, right? No. But uh, you would walk, say you walk into, it, people didn't recognize you. So you can get around the food store a little quicker and stuff like this. Not anymore, right? But um, I, would leave, I would leave you a little bit you know, with that as far as um, the idea of constituent service work, the idea of how you help, you know, how you can really help people, um, and also the fact that um, not all the important things about being in office necessarily happen in Trenton. Um, you'll see that we go all, all throughout the state. One of the most things I, I enjoy the most is like tonight. Today I was at uh, Monmouth University um, here at, at Rowan University. Can't wait for the veterinary, you know, the only veterinary school in New Jersey to have, to be here. And it, actually, that's interesting. One of the issues I heard, one um, uh, veterinary, uh, veterinarian student wanted to go to veterinary school. I says, well, we gotta have something. I was brand new. We gotta have something in New Jersey, because no. We had to actually get out seats allocated from out of state. So now we're going to have a, uh, a veterinary school in New Jersey at a great place, Rowan, Rowan University. Um, and really, it would be you know, uh, terrific. But, so just remember that. The issue about the constituent service work, um, if you won, you run for elected office. Uh, a couple other things, you can't be afraid to lose. You can't be afraid to lose. If you're too afraid to lose, you're not gonna get anything done, all right? And the other thing is too, the other is, is there's always, always something else that you can do, right? Um, I went from being an accountant to working at some pretty, good, some pretty good companies to doing this, and as I said, one of the key principles I have is, um, you know, have faith, things, some things just happen for a reason. Also be, be uh, optimistic, and the other one is, the harder I work, the luckier I get. The harder I work, the luckier I get. So I'm going to stop talking right here. I know we got some some questions, and anything that you guys you know would have, I'm 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 an open book, right? Could be a pretty boring book, but I'm an open book. All right, thank you, uh, thank and you. And just so you know, my wife Rita, who had met uh, Dr. Dorkin, all uh, right, we had. Lunch. We had great we lunch. Had good, I and drove up we've to been uh, together yeah. a few times. So when I was uh, coming down, Rita goes, goes, tell, tell, tell doctor I said hello. Right? I, so <laughs> very sweet. I am a fan as well. So let's just go around of applause for the center. <laughs> so we had some actually pretty uh, probing questions uh, here on, on a bunch of different topics. So we're going to try and run through them here. And, the, and first begins with redistricting, which we a process. We right. just went through. And just for the purposes of uh, explaining it to uh, those who are not in my Jersey politics class and haven't learned how this works yet. Um, so the legislative redistricting uh, effort is now complete. New boundaries have been established for the state's 40 legislative districts. Now, unlike many other states, uh, which you have a situation where whatever party controls the legislature Mm -hmm. controls the redistricting, we do it differently here in New Jersey. Here, five Republicans and five Democrats are appointed to a commission. The Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court selects an 11th member to represent the public and serve as chair. And this year, that 11th member was the retired Judge Philip Karchman. The consensus that Karchman was able to help forge on the commission resulted in the first legislative map to be approved with a bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple questions related to this. And first, uh, it relates to the process. Does the New Jersey process of redistricting work? Is this how it should be done? And are there any changes that we should consider to the process of how we do redistricting here in New Jersey? I, interesting. Um, the, this is the first time that I was actually, I wasn't one of the five commissioners, um, but I got, I was able to, uh, because I was a Senate Republican leader, um, and Assemblyman John DeMeo, who's the Assembly Republican leader, 
we were we were basically in the room watching when this stuff was happening. And I got to tell you, it was it was it was it was very interesting. As a legislator, and I'm sure Senator Durr uh, was was concerned about this, and the assemblywoman was concerned about this. What's my district going to look like? And then you're getting all kinds of you're hearing all kinds of rumors. You have no idea if they're true, right? But you're hearing all kinds of rumors, and I'm, the last, and because of the pandemic, because of coronavirus, this is actually an eight-year map, uh, I would say, as opposed to normally a ten-year map. Because what generally happens is after the census, after the census, the uh, you get the redistricting, and the redistricting is basically based upon it's based upon population, right? Uh, you know, uh, each each district is supposed to be approximately the same size. But when they were doing it, I guess 12 years ago, was when it was happening, I was hearing all kinds of different rumors about what was happening, say, with my district. And quite frankly, you, you, you're a little bit you know, concerned. And in that one, what ended up happening, the, the tiebreaker picked one of the maps. Judge Carr, and he, he picked the uh, Democrat map, all right? Um, and there was uh, six votes for the Democrat map and five votes for the, for the Republican map. This time, and I, I was able to be in there and watch. Judge Cartman was, he was tough. He, he wanted to have, you know, the situation was that we're going to have uh, the idea of a consensus map. And what happened is you go down and you have all the kind of data, all the data about population, voting data, and, and obviously all the district data. And, the, and it's so interesting that as they move one little town, it has so much effect on, the, on drawing the lines for a lot of other districts, right? And, and so Judge Karchman had given a, a bunch of principles that he wanted to make sure it happened. Like, for example, one was is enough, the idea of the population differences. Um, Judge Karchman said he wanted no more than a 5% uh, discrepancy. Two and a half plus or two and a half minus, right? Meaning as far as within the, in the uh, population size. So all the different maps that absolutely and, you know, went through um, and trying to, um, I guess, you know, go with the principles that he had, he had set. Then for the first time, they actually published the first map. One was called Parkway and one was called Turnpike. Right, and believe me, both parties, the Republican and Democrat party, go. We know this isn't going to be the final map, and we know because. But it was kind of like, okay, you know, from a strategy standpoint, what map do we put out? Right. So obviously, from the Republican, my my um, advice was, you can't put out a map that shows Republicans can't get in the majority. But a lot of people had different kinds of you know opinions about what kind of map you have. What if Judge Karchman actually picks? One map versus the other, and so, but there was quite a bit of um, you know back and forth, and then Judge Carson, when there wasn't getting some agreement, and there was quite a bit you know back and forth between the Republicans and Democrats, uh, working very well, uh, but obviously completely, completely different objectives, right? And Judge Carson brought them, everybody into the room and, and uh, the commissioners, and said, "Hey, listen, if if you're going to um, not coming with a consensus map, neither one of you are going to like the map you get. So he was, uh, in my opinion, now the you know, uh, judge wasn't you know, saying what he, he was necessarily thinking there, but I think what he would, would have done is said, okay, I'm going to take two real, real bad maps and start looking at changing each one until some, one, somebody says, okay, fine, I'll, you know, I'll take that. And he says, no matter what, you're not going to like the map you get. No matter whatever party you have. So then the, um, the uh, commissioners you know, looked, and I think the final vote was uh, nine to two. Nine to two. Uh, and actually, interesting enough, Judge Karchman didn't have to vote because he's a tiebreaker. So, but he did. He did vote. Um, and that's, you know, quite frankly, that, that's how it occurred. But there was a lot, I, probably 20 different iterations that had happened within, um, uh, you know, at least on the Republican side, and I'm, I'm sure just as many or more uh, on, on the Democrat side. 
But it's a pretty interesting. Now, should it should it should it change? I think the way Judge Karchman did it was was a, was a very good way. Set up the principles as far as how it would work. Um, we have a very diverse state. He wanted to make sure that there was you know enough majority minority you know uh, districts. He obviously wanted to make sure that you know towns were you know contiguous. Um, down here in South Jersey, and as well as all us in, in North Jersey, we have some pretty big districts. Like for example, the district that I'm in right now, and people are confused too, because now they think that the new districts you got your new district, but it, the new districts they don't take effect until January 2024. So as an elected, you will run, whoever decides to run, uh, will run in a June primary in 2023, and then in the, in the November election in, in 2023 to serve that district. But my, the, my current district, I think is actually the largest geographic district in the state. And if you go, say, from the northeastern tip of Vernon, to say the southwest tip of of white, it's a uh, it's about a two hour trip, you know. And, that's and then all you in have your district. that's all in the district. And then you got other districts. Because I one time one assemblyman said to me, "How many events can you get to in in a night?" Because I said, "Well, it depends where they are. Something in Vernon versus something in Oxford or White. It's gonna I can one." And he says, "Wow, I get to he goes, he could walk his district." If I walk my district, I lose 55 pounds, you know, in one trip, you know. So anyway, but I do think the I, I think the process uh, worked um, uh, this this time. I could certainly see where um, it's going to go back to. There's going to end up being a, a tiebreaker because I do think uh, Judge Karchman was was very strict in what he what he wanted done, and he wanted to make sure he came up with some sort of consensus. Now. On the Republican side, I think we had, I think our commissioners did, did very well. Because um, uh, right now we have 16 seats. I think there is, I think if you take a look at it, I, the way I uh, spoke about it within our caucus, I think on the uh, Republican side, the risk of losing seats is a lot less than the opportunity of picking up seats that uh, in more uh, competitive, more competitive districts. Uh, let me just follow up a little bit on the, since you praised uh, or admired uh, Judge Karchman and how he handled it, one of the things about the redistricting process in New Jersey is that there are virtually no rules for whomever is the 11th member. So you may or may not get somebody who plays it like Judge Karchman did uh, uh, this time 10 years from now or eight years from now. Should that be legislated? Should those kinds of, we want you to do it with these, set out these standards, et cetera, should there be more guidelines for the 11th member? That's, uh, honestly, I think it's a very good suggestion because let's say you got three branches of government and you, the uh, Chief Justice gets to pick the tiebreaker. Now, in, in 12 years ago, there was a, uh, the t quote unquote tiebreaker was on, because what, what happens is the commissioners uh, will, will submit um, suggestions for a tiebreaker. 12 years ago, the individual who's a tiebreaker was on both lists. So the Chief Justice had an easy easy pick, pick that individual. Uh, this time, there, were no, there, there was no agreement on a, on a tiebreaker, uh, so the Chief Justice had to, but you think about it, that's where the judiciary has a huge role in determining what the legislative districts will be, depending upon what tiebreaker uh, that individual picks. Um, I do think that uh, when uh, Judge Karchman had came, come up with the set of standards to use, I, I probably think that's something we should take a look at and say, should we have a particular sense of what the district should be, look like, and also um, maybe how a, a tiebreaker you know, gets, you know, uh, gets selected. So it's something where the legislature can actually, um, you know, put it in. But interesting enough, then I, I think that would probably require a change to the Constitution, which obviously goes to the voters. Sure. Um, now that you are a leader uh, and not just uh, a state senator, um, 
the questions came in about the National Republican Party. I hate that term, leader. Uh, I, think, yeah, I don't know if you guys know. Everybody watch Lost in Space. The young kid, right? Is, I feel like, take me to your leader. <laughs> you know, just, you know, so, anyway. <laughs> the question came in from somebody. Uh, Do you expect former President Trump to run again? And is this a good thing or bad thing for the Republican Party? I, honestly, who knows? Who knows what President Trump is is, is going to do? Whether you know from a business standpoint or from a uh, from an election standpoint, um, to you know, we, we live in a country where anybody 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 can run. Um, I think that um, looking at I, I, you know, he he was just at CPAC, got a got a, a great reception there. Um, personally, I think he will. I think he will run. Um, whether that's a good thing or, or not, um, that's going to be up to that's going to be obviously up to the people. Uh, and how many you got? You know, millions and millions and millions of votes. What, Seventy million votes or something uh, uh, last time. The one thing I would say is that um, you always got to worry about how you. My, I mean, my standard bearer for who a president I love to see happen was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, you know, sometimes I would say there's, there's a kind of, he would be able to tell you to go to hell and you look forward to the trip, right? <laughs> and, but he had, a, and, and it was when I was just coming on in, into a, um, uh, in, 19, in the 1980s when I was just starting uh, actually, my career, and in 1981, starting with with my family, and I remember how he had lifted up the country, you know. After, and I think brought back the idea of you know it was okay to be an American again and and, and whatnot. And I and I do think that quite frankly, it's it's really up to. I really love the results and how you get things. I you know in the policies that uh, with respect to you know President President Trump. Sometimes you know the rhetoric. Can be can be changed, but the rhetoric on anybody, on any side, but it's it's really up to the up to the people and anybody as long as you fit. Was it 35 years or old uh, that you can you can run you can run for president? And I think what you're going to end up seeing you're going to end up seeing uh, a significant number of um, Republicans and probably a significant number of Democrats getting into the into the primary. If you had been governor over the last two years, oh God, <laughs> what would you have done differently to address the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, that's interesting because if you go back to um, two years ago, when it first started, we didn't know what to expect. We really didn't. We didn't know what coronavirus was, or we didn't know how lethal it would be. We thought, I remember sitting in a, um, a parking lot watching people come out of the a food store spraying the door handles so that they wouldn't become infected. The door handle that they just touched, nobody else had touched. But it, So the fear factor was, was I think, pretty, pretty high. You think about what we came through. We didn't have testing. There's obviously no vaccine. And as I said today, thank God for real smart people like research universities and stuff because, and our manufacturing you know, sector. Um, the New Jersey Manufacturing Extension Program uh, worked a lot with John Kennedy and our manufacturing caucus because they couldn't get necessarily all the, the supplies that they needed for some of the, so, and the idea of who was a essential worker, who wasn't, you, you know, people work it. So there was a lot of things that, we, you know, had to, you know, had you know, to learn and, and deal with. Um, a tough night when uh, I get a call how many body bags we needed at one of the nursing homes, and it's been in newspapers, and, um, and the call came came to me and I tried to um, uh, coordinate with uh, Superintendent Pat Callahan in getting the uh, the body bags and, 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 and whatnot. And but we learned a lot of different. We learned a lot of different things through there. I remember we and the, the legislature. Um, we had never been remote before. You should have heard some of those first meetings. You know, yeah, you had the Muppets. 
stringing up the lights to Christmas thing? It basically sounded like that, right? Where's the mute button? You know, cause, yo, Senator, can you please go on mute? Because I can't find the mute button. But now it's completely, it's, it, it's completely different. I mean, I think the, you know, the 40 senators and the 80 assembly people, we've done a lot of things. We've learned how to, how to, how to get things done you know, uh, quickly. Um, some of the things I think we, we should have done, and like I said, the, you know, the challenge we had, and I think everybody should be proud of the fact of uh, the adaptability that we had. We, we, we've gone through a new paradigm. Working is going to be different. You're, you're, the way you work is going to be completely different than when I started, completely different. Um, people can work, you know, anywhere, and they've learned how to do things. And I think uh, that was coming, but I think the pandemic just accelerated that, you know, that ability. Um, I think um, things that should have been different, should have been different. The legislature, the executive orders, and the emergency, states of emergency should not go on for that long without the legislature. We're a co-equal branch of government. We are, we are a co-equal branch of government. And um, for a long time, we were on the sidelines. And as a former football coach, I, even, I said, listen, we have to be in the game. And quite frankly, I think um, the, uh, any party, the governor, a governor of any party, and this is a little bit of how the, the legislation works. The Republicans had two, two different bills. One was, was a bill that would say the state of emergencies could not last for more than 14 days without the governor of any party coming to the legislature to, to approve the extension, all right? What governor, you know, I was a co-sponsor of the bill. And one of the issues is that we wanted to show what, what had been happening. What governor is going to, it's got to go through the legislature, it's got to go through the committee, got to go, uh, you know, on the Senate floor, then the assembly, you know, the committees, the assembly floor, and get to the governor's desk. I don't think any governor, any party, is going to sign up because they're going to say, wait, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to limit my authority. So what we did, and we're going to do it again, um, <laughs> is we have a constitutional amendment. And I was a sponsor of the Constitutional Amendment. Um, and what the Constitutional Amendment says is, is that the same thing is basically what the bill said. Now, it was 14 days. You could quibble. Should it be 30 days? But we can move you know, pretty, pretty quickly just in the ability to have you know, some of that you know, uh, negotiation and influence. What's the difference between the Constitutional Amendment and the bill? Well, first of all, the governor you know, if, if you do it in one session and you get a you know, super majority, you can go right, to the, you can go right to, the, to the ballot. If you get a, a majority of both houses in two consecutive years, it can go right to the ballot. The governor doesn't have to sign it. And who decides that, a change in the Constitution? The people. The people do. So a number of times I made, or twice specifically, on, on just that bill, I called that make the order of the day, um, and unfortunately each time when I got through and I made the motion to uh, relieve the bill, it was um, tabled. And as you know, once it's tabled, all discussion stops and a, a vote is taken, and that ends, that ends it. But I, it's something I'm going to continue to push because it's something that let the people decide. If that's something that they want to have. We've all been through this for two years. I think the legislature, and I was part of a committee, that what we did is we worked with, um, I got a call from the New Jersey Business Industry and the Chamber of Commerce. There was a coalition that had been put together. You remember the whole lockdown stuff and all the different industries and stuff? Well, what, we, what happened was the business groups had, had gotten a hold of me and they had established a coalition, and I think it was well. It ended up being well over 200 different businesses and industries and associations and whatnot. And they all had their re remember the idea of reopening, right? Mike Eginton is back there, the Chamber of Commerce, and Andrew Music was with BIA at the at, at the time. And quite frankly, what we did is the legislature, not you know, we we held some. Um, Public meetings, you know, public, you know, Zoom type thing, 
And what it did is it gave the, the businesses and the industries ability to talk about what their opening plans were and to demonstrate now what, you know, a business, they want to be open, but one of, the, one of the most important things they do is they know their customers, they don't want to put their customers at risk. Their brand, their reputation is the most critical thing that they can have. They don't want to put their employees necessarily at risk. And, and uh, thank God for all the healthcare workers, the first responders, the police, the fire soldiers, they all go to work, the people in the, in, 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 in the food stores and stuff, they're all going to work. So what we did is we gave them the opportunity on a bipartisan basis, I know it was uh, myself, Senator Sarlo, Senator Singleton, and Senator Ruiz, and gave the businesses an opportunity to talk about the reopening plans. Now the administration was funny, because the administration would always say, these are having no effect whatsoever on, on, on our decisions. But it certainly seemed that every day after we had a meeting, changes came. So that, to me, demonstrates the fact that if we, if the legislature um, was more involved, I think you know some there would have been a, more influence as to as to what might happen. But I think what critically has to happen is it has to be a constitutional amendment where the voters decide and and say that hey they expect the legislature because we get a lot of phone calls to be the co-equal branch of government that they expected. The. Uh we had a question about the budget. The governor is about to propose his budget uh, publicly. I uh, think on March 8th, uh, so just coming up a few days away. Uh, governor Murphy has said publicly several times that he will not raise taxes in his second term. Uh, you understand the state budget as well as anyone. Do you think keeping this pledge is even possible given the uncertainties of our economy? Well, in interesting enough, because it, there are tax increases already. There's actually a tax increase for unemployment. Um, Mike Eginton and Andrew, they all know, for, um, there's the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund that there was a $300 million increase last year. There's going to be another approximately $300 million increase on July 1st of this year, and then another one on July 1st of 2023. So quite frankly, there are tax increases in there already that had already been then put in. And also there was tax increases for employees uh, for, for, for the payroll tax. Um, the one thing that, that, is, that, that, is, that is happening though is for the second year in a row, our revenue, the, the revenue forecast that they had is significantly below the actual revenues that are coming in. So right now, we're expecting at least a three billion, us, and you know, we haven't seen the numbers. I mean, Mark is saying probably you know, higher, and Mark Maggar, he, he would know. We're hearing between three to four billion is the last that, that we could be in, in higher. So there's absolutely no need for any sort of uh, you know, tax increase. And in fact, the Republicans have a, a plan out there that says give it back. It says, so go, go to the uh, giveitback.us, sign up, and, uh, and quite frankly, it's, it, you know, uh, we think it's at least three billion, probably now closer to four. Last year, I think it was over five you know, billion. And uh, at the same time, like I said, going through, um, we, we, and, and this goes to the adaptability of the people of New Jersey and also the people of, of the United States. When this thing first started, and the lockdowns and everything that had occurred, Right, we 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 were all concerned about how bad is this going to be on the economy, on the revenues. You know, will we even have enough services? The, so the first thing we heard about a ten billion dollar decrease. Uh, then we heard as high as a thirty billion dollar decrease, and we started really being very concerned. But the cash flow, and the one thing as a CPA, you know, you follow the cash, right? The cash flow was just not going down. And it was because the people of New Jersey were helping businesses. They knew. They, they, so what they, what, what they did is whatever they could do to help. Uh, and then listen, businesses got hit real hard. You know, you know, thir, you know um, three in ten businesses you know, clo you know, had closed down. Uh, hopefully more and more will continue to, to open. But what the people of New Jersey did is they went out and they knew and they tried to help as, as, much, as, as much as they could. So actually, the revenues, they weren't down. They were higher. They were higher than had been 
that had been expected. And quite frankly, they were higher by a, a considerable, considerable amount. And it happened again this year. So one of the things that uh, when there's revenue uh, coming in, it allows legislators to be creative. What are we going to do? We have a few more options uh, to think about this. And so the question came in, you know, given the focus on affordability, which has been talked about on both sides of the aisle, is there potential for fundamental tax reform, not just giving it back, but really changing our tax structure, including dealing not just with state taxes, but obviously New Jersey's high property taxes. Yeah, well, first of all, and it's interesting, Doctor, you mentioned the affordability. And I, I will tell you, I have been in on, on the Republican side, obviously since I've been in there my, my whole, you know, um, registered, you know, voter life, um, we had given many plans for, of how to uh, deal with uh, the affordability uh, of, New, of New Jersey. And yes, there is, there, there absolutely is. There's a few things that I think we could certainly do. And one thing that I'm always focused on is the idea of capital. If you keep capital in New Jersey, that being you know, investment capital, that being obviously those um, you know, individuals or you know, people that have um, you know, retirement you know, income so that they don't, aren't leaving the state and stuff, you actually, in my opinion, that's when your revenues actually you know, uh, go up. How could we do some of that? And some of it, we really do have to help our, our, our charities and whatnot. We have a few ways of doing it. One, we just put a bill in for indexing the uh, income tax brackets to the rate of inflation. The federal government has done that for 40 years, and New Jersey has never, has, has never done it. Uh, so the idea of indexing for inflation. So you don't have, get what's called bracket creep. Um, another thing I think that we should uh, absolutely do is Listen, retirement income, right now, we, we it used to be where New Jersey would give an exemption of $10,000 on retirement income. Uh, it's, it's now up to uh, $150,000 of, of retirement income. And I'd love to see where we actually get rid of the taxing for, for the retirement income. Um, and here's why. Because you actually keep, ca you keep people here with their families and whatnot. And what they do is they spend money. So you actually get in the sales tax, right? But they actually spend they actually spend that uh, that money. The other thing I think we can do is a charitable deduction. Now in New Jersey we have very few deductions. Property taxes uh, to a limited uh, to fifteen to fifteen thousand. Um, but you can uh, if we had the data is you know tough to uh, tough to you know decipher. But I've done some calculations. With, with the uh, help from Office of Legislative Services, that based upon federal returns, charitable organization, charitable contributions given for people who have some sort of nexus in New Jersey is in the range of $10 billion. I will guarantee you a lot of that goes out of state. So the idea is, and it was a bipartisan bill, it actually passed the Senate una unanimously. It, unfortunately, it didn't get a hearing in the in in the assembly, but it passed it passed the Senate unanimously, um, and as I said, it was bipartisan. And what that would do is allow people to and Mark and I worked on this allow people to take a deduction for charities that they give to, for the contributions they give to New Jersey charities, food banks, homeless shelters, you know things things like that. Um, the issue with down in Trenton. I think a lot of times people say they always look at the pocket of Trenton, right? They said, "Well, we're going to lose, we'll lose two hundred fifty million dollars." And I said, "Okay, just on a just back it on a calculation. Let's say that half the money goes out of state, and I, I think it's probably more than that. You're talking five billion, right? If you're able to just get twenty percent of that back, a billion dollars." Would you trade a billion dollars going to our charities for a $250 million deduction in the Treasury? Because what ends up happening in, on, the, on the budget committees of both the Assembly and, and, and the Senate, every year those charities will come asking for money from the state budget. I have seen many people, whoever is happy to write a tax check, nobody. 
Who's ha who smiles when they give a charitable contribution to help somebody? Everybody. And they can do it a lot more efficiently, efficiently than, than the government can do it. And they do, and so anyway, that's, that's a few of the things that I think we can actually do. And the idea that I've talked about many times, and unfortunately, people hear me speak often, they said, are you still on that capital kick? Yeah, I will, because you keep, you, you keep capital here, you keep money and investment here, that creates, you know, I used to say uh, capital is, is like water, it follows the path to, to, of least resistance. But I, I add a part, to success. Because, it, it, you know, and quite frankly, New Jersey is a great place. A tra you, you look at the assets we have, and I'm sorry I'm on my soapbox right now for a minute, but you look at the assets we have. We're, we're between Philadelphia, two major financial capitals of the world, Philadelphia and New York. And I'm not the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but I know our location's not changing, all right? We're still gonna be between Philadelphia and New York, I know for the rest of my life, right? But you think about it, we got the mountains, right? We got the shores, we got, we got four you know, seasons. In 2004, CFO Magazine, C Chief Financial Officer Magazine wrote, New Jersey crashed into the bottom. We had never been in the bottom of any category of where to start a business. Then we crashed into the bottom and we just haven't been able to get out. So I've always looked at, if you can keep capital in New Jersey, that's what you, that's what you actually absolutely want to do. So I think the idea of indexing, I think the idea of retirement income, I think the idea of charitable contribution for charities in New Jersey are things that we can absolutely do. And quite frankly, I actually think it will help bring more capital back to New Jersey. And that, honestly, will help the Treasury of New Jersey not hurt it. Let me, uh, we're going to finish up with a, a question that we ask all our guest speakers uh, here as a bit of our RIPAC tradition. Senator, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you were in college? I wish I knew when I was in college. Um, I got to tell you, on a beautiful day like today, when you're at Rowan University, you're walking around, I want to go back to college. <laughs> Seriously, I, 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 wish I, I wish I knew then what I know now, right? So, um, so what is it? Yeah, what, do you, what, do you, what do you wish you knew then? <laughs> I wish, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, listen, I pray every day. I wish, I, you know, uh, you know, knowing that what kind of, you know, family would end up having. Um, I, you know, it's one thing if, if people say, because I'm a CPA, I'm a certified, how much, you know, how many times you, you, you must put your own plan together. So, yeah, I've done enough planning and some of this, but I've really left things to say, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get, you know, you know type of things. Um, growing up through my career, and I gotta tell you, there was some pretty interesting times and I thought I for sure I'd lose a job because I told, one time I said to, in, at the, in the boardroom, I said, uh, somebody said, well, what do we gotta do to, to go public and stuff? I said, well, here's what we gotta do. You know, and there had been a, a, a major issue within the company. I said, you gotta fire this individual. One of the board members slams their hand and goes, no way. I said, well, I just lost my job. You know, and anyway, so the chairman says, he says, um, he says, uh, well, escort that individual out of the building today. So I actually kept my job and so this, but I, I, I wish I knew uh, then um, not to worry as much. I'll tell you, two books that I read, that I think most important books that I had, because uh, when I got out of college, Rita and I, we had uh, Rita Mary, like, 11 months later, and um, that really went according to plan, and I would change nothing. I would change nothing. We have five beautiful kids, Rita and Mary, she's a CPA, Steve is a CPA, my son Sean's an engineer, my daughter Kathleen's a pharmacist, and my youngest son James, he's also an accountant, CPA, he was, he was a, a former Army, Army Ranger, uh, Stephen was a um, military intelligence. Uh, so I, 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 I wouldn't change anything, but what I would do is, I would have read these two books earlier. One was um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie, okay? The other one is how to, how to Stop Worrying and Start Living. 
And I did that when I was um, working for, I was taking the bus back and forth uh, to work. And I just found myself worried about everything. And then, so I picked up the book and I read it. I said, you know what? Accept the worst that could happen. That's really the theme of the whole book. Just accept the worst that can happen and go, and go forward from there. And the idea of how to, you know, the other part of uh, how to win friends and influence people um, was uh, in, in very important to me as well. And really, what you go through, and I'm a, a reader of um, Saint uh, Mother Teresa, right? And it's got a, she's got, they have a great book of her quotes each, each day. And it's really small, you know, quite, it doesn't take very, really, I, listen, I'm not, as like I said, the smartest bulb in the chandelier, but I can even read this book, you know? And just some of those quotes about, and it puts it into perspective a, a bit, but um, it all boils down to, to me, it's kind of like the golden rule. And I, I, I really believe that, and the same thing with respect to in, in politics, that treat others how you want to be treated. And uh, have, rela we're not gonna agree. Believe me, we're not going to agree on everything, and so, but it's, it's how you do it which is, is important because you never know when you're going to have to try and influence that individual. And I'll tell you, as, a, as a, uh, Senator Durr will, say in, uh, will tell you, in the, in the um, reorganization meeting, I told the, the, the majority party, the Democrat party, goes, I pray every day that you're going to agree with me, right? And I pray every day that I have the perseverance that someday you're going to agree with me. I know that that's not necessarily going to happen, but I also pray the fact that I want to treat people, you know, with with respect, and um, you know, that, you know that's it. so. I, I think what I wish I would have known then in, in college um, was that um, thing, things will be okay. The harder you work, the luckier you get, um, and uh, how to stop how to stop worrying and start living, and also how to win friends and influence people. On that note, let's thank Senator Steve Orojo. I want to just thank, thank you all for coming out tonight. Please note on the back of your program, we've got another senator, Senator Scutari, coming uh, in April. We're actually, on March 31st, uh, going to have a humorous academic debate uh, here on, New on April Fool's Eve, the eagle versus the turkey, which is more American? That will be a huge program. We hope you'll come. Uh, make it a date night. Come on out to that. Until then, everybody have a safe trip home. Thanks for coming out tonight.